Um, good evening, all of you. It is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Shirgil Sundaram Arts Foundation or SSAF. My name is Latika Gupta and I work at the foundation as director of projects. To briefly introduce SSAF, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the work that the foundation does, it was established in 2016 with the mandate to carry forward the legacy of scholar and photographer Umrao Singh Shergill. His daughter and a pioneering figure of modern Indian art, Amrita Shergill, and her nephew and niece, the artist Vivan Sundaram, and filmmaker and television journalist Naveena Sundaram. SSAF is committed to advancing creative independence and supporting alternative and heterodox practices. And I'd encourage you to visit our website, ssaf.in, to know more about our programs. The SSAF lab was set up as an incubatory space for discursive, processual, and experimental strategies of practice. It lends itself to interdisciplinary dialogue through multiple formats, such as workshops, talks, symposiums, screenings, and longer duration practice-based projects that further the objectives of the foundation. And since its inception, um, SSAF's mandate has been to support and enable conjunctions of artistic and cultural practice that deal with historical memory with a view towards futurities based on secular principles and freedom of expression. And it is these principles that form the bedrock of Subhashri Krishnan's multi-format research and film project, Facing History and Ourselves, that has been supported by SSAF Lab. Image and Memory, uh, this evening's panel, is the second in a series curated by Subhashri as part of the project that examines concepts of citizenship that lie within and outside the legal and bureaucratic imagination in India and the different ways in which people negotiate and reclaim them. The series includes academics, lawyers, poets and filmmakers whose work critically engages with borders, the nation state, and particularly in the context of the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, and the National Register of Citizens, NRC, and its long and violent history in Assam that can be traced to the partition of the Indian subcontinent. The project foregrounds oral testimonies as a mode of creating alternative histories of people and places, along with material traces that enable a memory of belonging alongside ethnic, religious, and linguistic categories. And all of this um, as a sort of a proposition or a way to start building an archive of people and their lives beyond legal categories that are mandated by the nation state. Um, the first panel, Citizenship and its Discontents with Malini Sur, Abdul Kalam Azad, Rupali Samuel and Sahana Ghosh is available to view on our website. Um, Subhashri will be speaking more about this, but the four films curated by her in Image and Memory foreground questions of belonging and exclusion. They asked what it means to be located on shifting grounds, quite literally in Chor, floating islands that emerge and are subsumed by the river that has changed course, having been dammed as part of the nation building project, or when the landscape itself changes irretrievably and memory becomes a more reliable site to locate one's past in the present. When papers, documents of birth and death and those that prove one's participation in the ritual of citizenship through voting fail to prove the legality of belonging to one's homeland, where differences in dialects, language, and religion mark bodies as sites for violence to be repeatedly enacted. And we see that happening even now. And particularly in the context of traumatic events, how might documentary films then become the repository of social memory in which individual histories and narratives visibilize events that are represent, repressed in official chronicles. These films don't just preserve memory as a trace um, to be looked at, but instead construct the past as a present through the act of telling. And in bearing witness, the films become testimonial where individual stories can become or create these collective histories as documents that function also as acts of refusal. Um, we're very grateful to Saurav Sarangi, Supriyo Sen, Dev Shri Nath, and Subhashri Krishnan for making the films available. And in case you haven't seen them, they can be viewed until the 28th of November. And you will find the link to the films 
um, in our website, which uh, will be in the chat box shortly. Um, most of you will already know Subhashi Krishna. She is a filmmaker whose work engages with questions of citizenship through lenses of memory, migration, and testimony. Her films include Brave New Medium on internet censorship in Southeast Asia, this or that particular person about official identity documents, what the fields remember about the Nelly massacre in Assam in 1983, which is one of the films in this series. Uh, Sikri Vasanai, Dance of the Butterfly, about a disappearing music form in the Chirang district in Assam. And a forthcoming film is called Shadow Lines, and it explores questions of citizenship and nationhood in contemporary Assam through the NRC exercise. She leads the media lab at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore, and is a part of the team that curates the Urban Lens Film Festival, which in fact just got over a couple of days ago. And before I hand over to Subhashree, who'll speak about the project um, um, and also introduce the panelists, a few technical points about this evening's event. Um, this is being recorded. We request all of you to keep your audio and video off through the event. And also, uh, please put your questions in the chat box, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. You can put these through the discussion, which Surabhi will be taking um, as she gets them, and also at the end. So over to you, Subhashree. Um, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Latika, to the project and what we hope to discuss this evening. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you, uh, first of all, to the Shergal Sundram Arts Foundation for supporting uh, this project, Facing History uh, and Myself. Um, as I often say, it's very rare uh, that you come across a collaborator who works with you and is uh, enables the vision that you want to take forward. So really heartfelt thanks. And from SSAF in particular, I'd like to thank um, Gayatri, uh, Saurav, um, Latika, uh, thank you so much for all the support. Um, I mean, you see our faces here on the screen today, but actually um, this evening, everything that's been put together is their labor. So really a heartfelt thanks to all of you. Latika has actually quite eloquently laid out uh, what the project is and um, in some ways what the curatorial impulse of bringing these four films together is. So I won't spend too much time, but just a couple of things. Um, Facing History and Ourselves, um, as I'd like to say, is, is a project. It's a transmedia project that looks at the afterlife of people who have actually uh, been incarcerated in the state of Assam. And <clears throat> the reason for this, I mean, and I'm very interested in this question of the afterlife is there's a way that we think about things when there's an event that unfolds. Um, you have many cameras, you have well-meaning civil society organizations going, but then once that moment is over, what unfolds is something that uh, interests me deeply. So that is the project. Uh, but there are two parts to the project. The first part of which uh, we're all part of this evening is to actually have uh, conversations with people who've been thinking about this question of um, citizenship, especially uh, in terms of in the Eastern part of India and partition and what is it, it has actually meant. Um, so that's part one of the project. Part two of the project is actually, which will now start from December onwards is the actual production. And hopefully by the end of it, there will be a set of uh, media materials that will be available in the online space. Um, th these four films that actually, I, I hope many of you have watched the films, which is Chor by uh, Saurav Sarangi, Way Back Home by Supriyo Sen, uh, Noor Islam by Devish Srinath, and What the Fields My Remember. I mean, the reason I felt like it would be interesting to bring these films together, because even though they're talking about different moments, and actually, even in terms of actual time, made across time, Supriyo's film is made in 2002, uh, Saurav's film, I think, was made in 2002. 12, correct me if I'm wrong, Supriyo, my film was made in 2015 and Dev Shri's film was made in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, after the final list of the NRC comes. But I think what all the films are, they talk to each other and what all, the films are actually trying to gapple with is this idea that we're all so wedded to, right? citizenship or nation state, um, that we're all part of this project, uh, what it does when in 1947, when the Radcliffe line was drawn, what it actually did to individual histories. Um, so I thought each of these films in different ways um, explores that question. And the second reason is also that um, 
I, I mean, in fact, the next panel, uh, which we will all be uh, uh, discussing as part of this project is called Trails of Partition, Assam and the NRC. So in many ways, what you see unfold uh, in Assam, of course, but in the rest of the country that we saw in the winter of 2019 or uh, 2000, January 2020 is actually a continuum, and especially in Assam, right? The, these debates around citizenship, once the partition happened, in many ways hasn't ended. And I felt that it may be interesting to uh, be in conversation to see how Devshri and Saurav, and unfortunately Supriyo isn't here, uh, he couldn't attend, but we will be discussing his firm, how they actually looked at this question and through what lens. So that is that is the reason these four firms are, are there. And as Latika mentioned, they're available until 28th of November on the SSA website. So if you haven't watched them, uh, please do. Uh, before I hand it over, I am going to introduce uh, Devashree, Saurav, and Surabhi. Um, many of you uh, would already know them, would be familiar with their works. But uh, I also wanted to say thank you so, so, so much so much uh, Saurav and Devishri uh, and also Supriyo for so readily agreeing to um, open out their firms and to also be part of this discussion and to you too Surabhi who I see as an ally, comrade, friend um, who has always been so generous with her time. Uh, thank you so much. Now I will do the formal bit of reading out your bios and then I will hand it over to you uh, Surabhi. Uh, Saurav Sarangi is an award-winning filmmaker from India. His debut, debut film, uh, Tusu Katha, is a lyrical observation of the marginalized lives of cultures in Eastern India. Bilal, the story of a child living with his blind parents, received a huge response in festivals, theaters, and TV stations, uh, winning many awards. Chor, which is the film we will be talking about today, The No Man's Island, is a feature documentary set at the India-Bangladesh border. Uh, Shot in Iraq, Karbala Memoirs is a visual, uh, which is his other film, uh, Karbala Memoirs is a visual elegy of a tragic war. Currently, Shorov is making a documentary uh, titled The Sinking Island set in the Sundarbans Delta of India and Bangladesh. Welcome, Shorov. Uh, we also have with us Devshri Nath, who is an independent filmmaker from India. She's completed her film studies from the National Institute of uh, Design India in the year 2020. She's always been interested in telling impactful stories, and most of her work reflects that as well. She believes that stories aided with a powerful tool of filmmaking can bring about a positive change in society. Uh, or at the very least start important conversations. And I, I couldn't agree uh, more with you, Devshri. I think the fact that we're all here in this virtual space talking is a testament to that. Um, and Surabhi, Surabhi Sharma has been an independent filmmaker making feature length documentaries and short films since 2000. Her documentaries, fiction and video installations engage with cities in transition using the lens of labor, music and migration. Her films have been screened and awarded at, the national, at national and international film festivals. She currently teaches in the film and media program at NYU Abu Dhabi. So over to you, Surabhi. And once again, thank you for uh, agreeing to moderate this. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the thank yous because we, we thanked all each other and that's now established uh, but it's uh, it's really wonderful to to be here subhashree for you know all four films that you curated for this evening were films that i was very familiar with i have seen over time sometimes in fact all of them i've seen multiple times um, and while thematically um, and in a kind of a linear uh, marking time in a particular historical timeline. Uh, perhaps I had imagined these four films in a trajectory, but watching these four films together threw up a bunch of questions that I hadn't thought of outside of the individual films, really. Uh, and, and that's been really, for me, the, the remarkable uh, thing. I, you know, so the structure of this conversation I want to do is by actually going over each film and trying to think about certain set of ideas uh, and then somehow bring the four films into a conversation. So what I did was I pulled out uh, one or two lines from each film that I want to just read out um, as a as a as a way to to sort of show how I'm thinking through this. Um, so, you know, the, the first film that I want to discuss 
and that because Shupriya is not there, we, uh, I'll discuss with you, Subhashri. But the quote I wanted to read out was uh, something his father says when they go back to the village, to his village. We first go to his village and then we go to the mother's village. But the father says the mango trees, the gooseberry trees are etched in my memory. I thought if man fails to remember, at least nature, trees, the land or the sky will remember me. So, um, you know, this, this, was, this was a line which I had not remembered from the film, although I've seen it two, three times. Uh, what I had remembered was the, was the, uh, the, the etching out of the, the, the partition tragedy or the partition narrative that we are all familiar with. You know, it was, it was something that I felt that, you know, this idea of borders and nation state and identity and citizenship was central uh, to the film. And it is really, and that is, I think, why it's in, in this curation. But this line and a lot of other moments, which I remembered, but didn't remember as, as the ones defining the film for me, which has changed now, is this idea of uh, not, not just memory, but this, this idea of memory not remembering either borders or nation states or citizenship. Uh, memory is taking on this very elusive nature, uh, which, is, which, which roots you in the everyday. And, and this is a theme in, in the way all four films ex extremely, uh, not just lovingly, but very minutely seem to document the sense of the current time unfolding with, the, of course, the common motif, the rivers, but with rivers and with fields and with the plants growing in the courtyard or the or the window or of course the photographs and and all the documents right um so i was wondering if if we can imagine and let's begin with Supriyo's film as a kind of not just a oral narrative of a personal history but also as a way to counteract the way uh, we have codified these narratives as being one centered uh, around citizenship and nation state. The debate, yes, it is, right? That, that is what is creating the uh, a tragedy after tragedy as it's unfolding decade after decade. Um, but these personal narratives seem to offer a counter uh, understanding or a counter imagination uh, uh, of this kind of larger uh, narrative. And I was wondering, you know, for you, of course, the story begins with partition. The story begins with these, these sort of festering wounds that uh, are never allowed to heal, even though individuals might want to move on, but you know our policies and our, our um, politics won't let us. Uh, but I was, I was wondering for you in, in Shorov's film, um, beyond that, the centrality of that uh, idea, uh, you know, the ways in which the father first and then the mother go back to their village and the complete shock of not recognizing, uh, but of saying that this is my land and Calcutta is just a place. You know, I really thought that that framed your debate actually and, and, and your project also quite interestingly. So just wondering if that's something you want to pick up and speak a little on. Yeah, I mean, actually, thank you, Surabhi. I'm glad, um, I mean, the panel's called Image and Memory. And I'm glad, actually, uh, this is the frame through which we're entering the, not just the discussion, Supriyo's film, because, um, of course, the film's about, um, you know, what partition leaves in its wake, not just to the individual history, but also he keeps connecting it back to uh, a larger structural history. And there's a critique of it, right, where, he's, where he speaks about the fact that, you know, you created three nation states and the decision was taking, taken actually in three months. Um, so, I mean, there's of course that, but it is actually uh, the everyday memory uh, is what the film recounts over and over again. And I see that as a form of, I wouldn't like to call, use the word resistance, but as a form of reclaiming, actually. Mm -hmm. The other moment in the film, uh, for those who watched the film, the two moments, but the other moment in the film, which I found personally very moving, was when his father and mother are in the boat and he's speaking. And so for those of you who speak Bengali, of course, sort of you would know, he speaks about the language, right? He, they move in 1950. And Bengal uh, is a certain way, but the language that's spoken in West Bengal, um, the Bengali that's spoken in West Bengal is very different. And he comes back and it's a certain 
it's a very pleasurable moment it's not just one of nostalgia but there's a childlike pleasure in the fact that oh my god i can speak this language which i found um, as a very uh, moving part in the film and 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 there's a childlike excitement so i completely agree with you right i mean in these and we all know this right in the writings of history uh, when we talk about the partition uh, whether it's an academic pieces or otherwise um whether that's in punjab or assam or bengal things are written in a certain way but i do feel that film is a space and here doesn't matter if it's fiction non fiction animation film is a space because of a certain uh, the tactility to it is a place where these kind of individual kind of memories these ways in which also people have relationship to a place because at the end of the day what does it mean to be a citizen right of course um, it is the paper document which we all have but it is a certain sense of familiarity it is about language it is about yeah that mango tree that you remember um, you know used to have mangoes in this month and i think supriyo's film actually uh, does that when uh, does that really well and there's a certain um, melancholy to the to that as well because what they left behind is not just that villa but actually these things also um, so i mean so i think that was very interesting in his film and of course the final sequence of the film where the mother um, goes to her village to visit her sister right and she meets her sister's family and i thought there was a very interesting part in supriyo's voice over that his aunt um who is a hindu woman who falls in love um with a muslim man and stays back and the rest of her family goes away so there's a certain transgression actually through love uh, she's able to do and the fact that he connects it to the idea of gandhi's idea of india perhaps was this and which i thought was again a very interesting way to end the film uh, so and which is part of the reason i also felt that it would be uh, even though it's it's not a sam and the nrc um it sets the tone for many of these conversations that we're having even today um, unfortunately in different contexts um, yeah yeah no absolutely for me the the fact that this frames the the current crisis or uh, or or the tragedy unfolding in assam is of course critical and it's very important but as you said uh, maybe not use the word subvert but it it offers another um, another lens to to bring it to the citizenship debate uh, and of course this is not the kind of uh, lens that we can we can argue in in legal courts or even when we are you know uh, writing history uh, and for, you know this this is this is what is this is what film does right this is this is what that uh that sound and that image together is able to create uh is you know is able to disrupt certain debates that seem fixed in their polarities um right. and and in the assam context i feel more so you know right. in in the assam context there's uh you know uh, so the the nrc debate and 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 the havoc it's creating now vis-a-vis -vis the caa debate which assam doesn't want to engage with like the rest of the country so there's there's a sense of you know complications over there uh, which of course is not what any of the films get into really directly but 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 there is a way in which uh, the contemporaries urging us to as filmmakers perhaps as artists to 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 get into the debate by creating these moments of uh, ambiguities if uh, ambiguity is not to make the politics uh, or, 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 or the narrative of violence ambiguous uh, but you know uh, there are ways in which uh, shupriyo's film is able to disrupt the the narrative of partition trauma uh, you know which which is i think the reason why it needs to be there and it's it's important uh you know so uh you know taking forward from from shupriyo's film actually uh i actually wanted to segue into into your film and and uh, not not uh, not uh, uh, sorov's film though sorov's film is the one that is 
made before yours, I, I think, be, between uh, Shupriyo's and yours. But the reason why I thought uh, it's important to go into your film, although it's made in 2015, is because of the Nelly massacre and uh, the politics of the 80s that actually connects directly to you know what what the partition is is doing and here again i want to pull out a quote from your film uh, which in a sense follows uh, in a in a very poignant and in a very tragic way from what shupriya said and it, it is this um, so sirajuddin ahmed in the film uh, says of his daughter who uh, actually i'll just read out the line uh, he 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 mentions to us that Two of his daughters had joined the protest carrying placards um, in the anti-foreigners protest that was ongoing at that time by the uh, the 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 uh, sorry AASU is um, all Assam all students Assam Union. Student Union. Yeah. Uh, and these these two young girls had had joined the protest and the the following days when the attacks happened and so Sirajuddin uh, Ahmed says. Um, uh, he says that uh, Rumi and my other daughters carried placards at the protest against foreigners. The moment before her soul left her body, she asked me, are we also foreigners? And then he goes on to say, how can I forget? You know, people ask me, basically, he says, people ask me to, to move on, but how can I forget, right? Uh, and, you know, again, the in a sense, the surprise of Supriyo's parents that they can't recognize uh, is sort of taken into a very crazy realm of this, this young child woman saying, uh, you know, we were part of the protests. Uh, are we the foreigners? You know, and, and the complete, again, non-recognition of, of the way of what politics, the mirror the politics is showing to uh, individuals, right? Um, so I know I know that many of these issues were what were what what was making you revisit this moment so many years later. Uh, the initial prompt, if I'm not wrong, was an attempt to not allow the erasure of history of that that moment, uh, just getting completely wiped out from not just the country's memory but also Assam's in a very deliberate way. Uh, but in, in that countering, and in 2015, literally at the cusp of when another phase of uh, you know tragedy is going to unfold, you made this film. So if you could just speak a little about you know really what what were the key ideas that you were working with, and in the making of the film, if I remember correctly, I think you were able to get a sense of where we are headed. It's already uh, you know 2014 had already happened. So you know if you can just speak about the the time that you were making the film and what was it that was really uh, right. pushing forward. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I hope I don't get into a long a rambling thing. So uh, what brought me to the film in the first place, um, I've, I say this every time, I've lived as a child in Assam. So in fact, when the Nelly massacre happened, I was living in this place called Tinsukia. Um, I was eight years old. And of course, we moved to some other place. And uh, when I read an article by this Tehelka journalist called Teresa Rehman um, in the year 2006, where she speaks about 20, 28 years after Nelly massacres happened, um, there is no memorial to one of the worst um, um, violent events that's actually taken place in the country. And she speaks about how people are coping. And it's a strange thing, right? Something gets triggered in you. And I re-remembered in many ways. And of course, I tried to find out uh, more about it um, it's almost as if it didn't happen um, or it uh, it existed in, in very small footnote type of thing. And of course, in 2013, uh, Japanese scholar uh, Makiko Kimura's uh, book actually came, uh, which is called Agency of the Writers, where she speaks to both the survivors and those who were the alleged uh, writers, um, because nobody actually went to jail. That's why I'm saying alleged. Um, and this actually got me interested. And around the same time, I remember reading this piece on the 1984 um, anti-Sikh um, uh, program that happened in, in the city that I live in, which is Delhi. Um, and I started thinking about this question. And I had anyway been interested in ideas of what kind of histories get 
uh, written, what kind of histories get left out and why. And of course, we all know the obvious, right? It is to do with structures of power. History writing is never innocent. Um, but when I went, I mean, so the first time I went was in 2013 um, for research and Reiki. Um, a shift actually happened, and this has to do with uh, Sirajuddin Ji, who I actually met the first time I went, because I was approaching this idea of amnesia uh, as an outsider, as somebody of a person of privilege, sitting somewhere and asking this question, why has it been forgotten? But I think once you go uh, to Nelly or any of these places, actually, people who've been through trauma, uh, people actually haven't forgotten. It's very much part of their lives. It's very much, um, they, they perhaps cope with it in a certain way. And I can't speak for certain what that coping is. I don't think anybody can. Uh, so in many ways, the project from which began as a kind of collective amnesia uh, became a thing of collective memory, right? And and as I was working on the, when I, when I started working on the film, it was 2013. Uh, and when I finished the film, it was 2015. And of course, um, we were at a so certain moment already by 2015, right? Things, we already began to see rumblings. I mean, the, I remember the FTI strike had uh, just started at that point, July, August, 2015. Um, and while I was actually uh, the last uh, phase of filming that had happened, and I'd gone back in 2015, February to do the last phase of filming, um, there were already talks about reopening the NRC exercise because the NRC 1951 happens uh, in the Assam Accord in 1985, uh, the ASU and the Rajiv Gandhi government decide to actually uh, revisit the NRC exercise. Nothing much happens until 2005. Sorry, I'm not giving a history lesson. And then actually in 2015, it rebegins. And I, when I was filming with Sirajuddin Ji um, and the other person, Abdul Khair Ji at that point, there was already an anxiety which of course I didn't film and there were some things that were there which of course is not in the film of oh my god how many times will we have to go over this over and over and over again um, and I wish I could uh, show this but uh, a young activist called Shahjan Ali with whom I've been filming in the recent past um, in response to my question of how you know the fact that you have to show your documents again um, he says very evocatively but you know, this, this slogan across the country that mm -hmm. our community has been doing it since the 60s, since the 70s, since the 80s. So there is this kind of exhaustion of how many times do you want us to show the document? And I'll just say this one last thing and end that whenever I've filmed in Assam uh, uh, with certain communities, the first thing that happens is people come and show you some form of ID to say, look, this is who I am. Uh, and I'm sure Devshri, you would have encountered it too when you were making your film Noor Islam, which is in some ways tragic, uh, but it's also telling of, in some ways, we're still at that moment of the 50s or 60s or 80s. Um, I'll just end here. Yeah. No, uh, I, I won't let you end here, sorry. I just want to, so, you know, uh, again, to try and keep drawing threads between the films, you know, your film and uh, for me, it's really the most powerful uh, sequence in the film and one that I've carried with me ever, ever since is the last sequence where, uh, you know, that, that kind of religious ritual of memorializing the, the massacre happens, right? And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sense of loss is being sung every year, the anniversary is marked and it is, it is a way to allow yourself to mourn but it is also um, a way to allow yourself to remember collectively rather than carry your individual traumas, right? So it's a very powerful uh, uh, moment for me. And again, to continue to follow that idea of ways in which um, communities and, and individuals sort of uh, disrupt the larger polemics uh, and in film, we and in all four films, that's uh, actually that's there. Um, is the is the use of song to memorialize, right? So of course, the partition story is has been memorialized over and over, and in fact, it's over memorialized according to me by all all, all the parties concerned. But uh, there is a way in which Shupriyo uses uh, songs that are not about the partition to to completely 
subvert what 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 uh, you know in solidifying that partition trauma story right he's using folk songs that are you know if one was to use a romantic word timeless to, yeah. to root it over there and the the last sequence in your film again offers song and ritual as a way to to just re-understand ways in which violence and traumas are understood by people or carried by people right uh yes how i have to show my paper again and i have to show my paper again and i have to show my paper again uh and then there is this song and ritual and anniversary being remembered differently from having to prove my identity yeah. my my song lives here you know it's almost as if it's offering that idea and i thought the, the fact that your film ends there is is really uh, important uh, and again a way in which sound and image can really uh, somehow capture those uh, those moments that just will not cannot be documented and perhaps should not be documented in in a kind of formal or informal register through the written word through through documents through archives it's a it's like a living archive i i think um i want to move forward from 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 there to uh, uh, Saurav's film. And I have a very short quote from Saurav's film that I want to uh, read out, which is uh, that um, Rubel, the boy that uh, Saurav follows more or less through the film, uh, he says uh, something very simple. He says, you need guts to live on the border. And uh, it's an innocuous line said to Saurav through the through the, the many days and years, in fact, that, that the camera and uh, keeps going back to their uh, lives. Uh, but I just thought, uh, you know, they, here is this, whatever, 14, 15, 16 year old boy, uh, well acutely aware of the tragedy of his, his life, his community's life. Uh, and he offers himself as a heroic figure. Uh, fully and in fact the film and Shorov has very very carefully in 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 perhaps the most attentive way possible listened to every moment of of being not here and not there uh, there is no no place right in 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 every which way whether it is your land whether it's your employment whether it is your citizenship you are on the periphery of legal illegal you know liminal is a liminal space gets almost as if you know uh, he he exemplifies what that means and within that context he says you need guts to live on the border uh, you know sort of doesn't make him a heroic figure sort of does not make him a tragic figure uh, either but he offers himself up as a as a hero and i was just you know taking that idea forward sort of again our understanding of borders of these liminal spaces of the people who don't belong uh who who can't really locate themselves anywhere uh you know in in at many registers which is really what your film is looking at within that when you spend you know the day to day with them and and uh, again i don't want to call it an oral narrative but in a way that you listen and 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 look at everything even if it's just that moment of the boys playing in the mud you know uh, there is there is there is a way in which again you are offering us another way of thinking about the tragedy of of borders and the and and the kind of the the epic political tragedies that we are sort of uh, you know, uh, assaulting our peoples with over and over again. So if you could just, uh, you know, I speak to that or respond to what Subhashri said about her own film or our discussion about, you know, I, I, I just want you to uh, take the conversation forward. Yeah, sure, sure, uh, Subhashri. I mean, uh, the quote that you uh, told me, even though I spent years uh, uh, by the side of the river, this was the first day of conversation with Ruben. Wow. <laughs> and it was a recce, and it was not supposed to be used in the film. It was shot that way with uh, just a handy cam. But I thought that moment meeting him for the first time and him, you know, introducing himself to me 
uh, is very important. That's why I kept it like that. And uh, to be honest, uh, you know, there is a temptation uh, as uh, to all filmmakers to tell a story very powerfully, the best way you could. And for that, we look for the characters who can tell the story, who can bring out the story. So, but here, what I tried to do is probably it's not a character story. It's a, it's a, I tried to create a canvas where each character you know, plays its own role because the river uh, is uh, probably is the, is the uh, main character which controls, which uh, takes forward, which blocks and which changes people's lives. And right. how, how the, and it has been happening for you know, ages. And I call them river people, like people live in deserts, they are desert people, they are forest people, they are mountain people, and they know the river very well. But when we uh, start looking at the river uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of um, system, which can be managed, which can be manipulated for the uh, benefit of man, humans, you know, we start something called river management and then the, the 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 understanding of the river people with the river which is a, a practical day to day and also very spiritual because it's 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 soul uh, uh, connection mm, that you know gets uh, you know somehow they come into contradictions <clears throat> and what happens after that we see the repercussions in my film and uh, that is one aspect and another point what i try to do in this context is that river is a like a connecting thread it always invites people to flow, come from one side to cross it over and go to the other side uh, and flow down from one point to another that's how the trade and commerce that's how relationships uh, you know the whole thing grows and that's what Ganga has been doing, uh, or Padma, uh, in that part, when as it enters Bangladesh of today, it does. But when you take that river, which is a connect point of connection, you know, a line of connection, as a line of uh, blockage, you cannot cross that. And then if you cross, you are uh, doing something illegal. So the trade, which used to happen for ages, from this part to the other part of the uh, other side of the river is now illegal. So the same rice, which used to travel from here to there, was a trade, and rubel becomes a criminal. You know? So a 14 years old kid, but for survival he has to do that. So who made his um, rebel a criminal, and he is aware of that. So I suppose that gives him very, you know, very clear idea that wh where we live in the mainland, yeah, and his life in Chor uh, is very different. His identity has changed. He is very well aware of that, but he won't express this pain, uh, which is which is very deep inside uh, to to everybody and every time. So I suppose how the nation plays its role. You know, in creating states, you know, the, 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 because if you look at this part of uh, uh, the um, India, I mean, the both the sides, India, West Bengal, and Bangladesh, uh, it, 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 it was the same region, right? It was uh, like in Punjab. So, so it's it's not very different. Suddenly, you know, you have this line which is invisible because you try to make the border always visible. Right. You make constructions, you make arrangements. But you here you made the border on, in the midpoint of the river. So it's, a, it's, it's re, literally invisible border. You cannot create a border there. So, so when uh, you see uh, Rubel or Sophie, you know, uh, calling, uh, you know, crossing line here and there, uh, I mean, nobody understands uh, the, 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 where the, really the border is. 
and I suppose that these all these things I did not want to make a very focused pointed film. I wanted to go into history, I wanted to go into the relationships, I wanted to go into the memories, I wanted to go into the a sense of betrayal because yeah. you betray your own people because when you lose your land and home to a river which is caused by construction of a large dam and yeah. it happens up 25 years after that because the after effects of building a dam you don't realize it uh, realize it immediately yeah. and you when you lose your land or home um, and you lose your identity and nobody is there to stand by you I mean I'm not talking about the politicians I'm not talking about the uh, uh, you know, district uh, officers I'm talking about your own relatives yeah. because you, you are left alone because you you have nothing and that's how we get lost and you live in a border, your childhood is stolen, your old age is fearful, yeah. and your, when you are young, uh, you, you probably leave the country and go somewhere else, migrate somewhere else to survive. So it's a, it's a very strange zone, I would say, which was a very normal, beautiful, and a very joyful place to live in has become a zone of fear. Yeah. That's what I, I tried to portray. I don't know. No, no, beautifully, beautifully portrayed. But you know, the important thing in the context of this conversation uh, that your film offers is precisely this, that you can harden the borders as much as you want, but these are porous borders. Uh, they, they have a long mm -hmm. history of you know the land not recognizing these borders you know forget forget people and policies and and uh, governments right so uh, in, in in that context actually one of the the, the speakers from the previous panels uh, malini sur uh, you know one of the essays from her book i just want to you know and i really feel that these two lines really for me um, uh, you know, really describes your film very beautifully, uh, sort of, is uh, she says, how do borders structure the lived experience of time? How do borders uh, reorder the linear measures of national history, uh, histories? So for me, for me, these two lines are just so central to way that your film is also, you know, that the, the way your film offers a telling. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the film form, it is, you know, the, 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 the way we want to tell a story is also disrupting certain ways in which we understand tragedies and stories. And I feel this sense of like, what is the sense of live time in these kinds of borders is really something that I feel motivates your film quite spectacularly, you know, just just cutting cutting to the moon every now and then just just to remind us that there is a certain circle of time that is outside of of humans. Yeah. And there is this the the sense of tides, there is the sense of then there's a sense of, you know, the the way time sort of defines the livelihood. So, you know, you're taking rice, in the rice is hidden something else, in, you know, then, then there's cattle at a certain kind of point in time, cattle is, is being smuggled. Uh, after your film was, was completed, I imagine cattle smuggling has, you know, has become way more dangerous, right? Because we have a, a new politics of, of, of cattle uh, in place subsequently so you know the the border is always a very very fraught and very dangerous place but i would imagine that now it's you know you are you are um, of course you were always illegal and everything you did was illegal but now uh, the stakes are that much more uh, sharp you know uh, but a constant reminder that the that these are porous borders and you know in that context how do we understand the caa how do we understand the nrc you know is religious identity linguistic identity the only way you know uh, so so your film offers again a disruption of 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 that paradigm that you know and of course none of us have accepted but we have started thinking in those terms as well right so 
for in terms of the sense of time in your film as 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 a way of disrupting this narrative i feel is very strongly there in subhashree's mm -hmm. film as well in in the way that you know she allows the narrative to end but the image stays on on the field or the river uh, mm -hmm. for a very long time mm -hmm. so so that it's hard to as when you are viewing the film whether it's the first time or the fifth time as i did this time but you know <laughs> when you're viewing it's like it's it's an invitation to actually think about is the river making you forget and move on or is the river reminding you or is you know it's it it's get gets into a very different temporality and and in fact i also feel in your film uh, i know i did not want to bring in form that much but really your choice of the night vision camera created another uh, another again another way mm. of thinking about porous borders you know mm. there's mm. there's a way in which mm. you are just saying uh, mm. don't believe what you see you know mm. <laughs> this mm. is not a real image this mm. is mm. you know there's there's so many ways in which uh, mm. in which your your film is really inviting us mm. to uh, to not just be content saying that these are these are these are bord borders are, are contested territories hmm. you know hmm. there's, there's a way in which your film invites us hmm. to just layer hmm. that debate uh, hmm. uh, in an experiential way which is which, hmm. which really is unsettling actually hmm. uh, and so thank thank you for for that i i don't know if you want to respond to that in any way or that those two lines of malini's hmm. essay that i read yeah i think it it's it's it it, uh, it is uh, it has a very uh, you know uh, direct connection to the my thought process what i wanted to portray uh, uh, through the you know narrative it, it's essentially it uh, the border actually uh, is is a memory uh, uh, that that uh, retains a lot of stories that happens uh, uh, i thank you for that and maybe i'll uh, get it uh, you know properly from you later and um, I'll just quickly uh, react to what you said uh, as quick as possible. First of all, uh, uh, the, the cow smuggling uh, from Indian part to Bangladesh, it's obviously for meat. And as we know, India is probably the largest meat exporter of the whole world. Yeah. And there are you know, states which uh, you know, specialize on that. Yeah. And and obviously the uh, Bangladesh being uh, the the Muslim population being more the demand is there so if there is a demand the supply has to be there yeah. and I I don't see these people doing any crime actually they yeah. they're meeting the demands okay but they do not have probably the capital the resources and the connection to the uh, government to do it legally so what they are doing as who as very small <clears throat> individuals uh, yeah. is becoming a crime which they have to pay with their lives yeah, yeah? so so that is you know one thing and about the border in uh, this area i want i want to tell you one story uh, uh, this is mushidabad district which is muslim majority mm. till now so on the day of the, uh, the, the independence, they thought they, they were uh, in Pakistan. So on 14th of August, 1947, the flag was hoisted for Pakistan. And everybody said that uh, Pakistan Jindabad, Pakistan Jindabad. The Hindus remain, OK, okay Pakistan Jindabad, and remain silent. Then the uh, news came, no, 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 this is not Pakistan, this is actually India. So all the Hindus came up and brought up the flag, <laughs> Hindustan, Jindabad, Hindustan, Jindabad. So this is a fallacy. This, yeah. If you look at this part of the world, this is, this is a fallacy uh, which we fell prey into, which led to a history that deeply affected the subcontinent. Yeah, yeah. And we, we should not forget that. We yeah. should not forget that this river became red not only for one night, for nights. Yeah. Because of that. Because of that. So, so uh, I suppose it was not uh, language, it was religion that was taken as the parameter to divide two countries. 
But if we go to Assam today, the situation is really complex because it was uh, the part of Bangladesh was annexed to Assam to give it support, where the Bengali language was incorporated within Assamese. Uh, so first you can tell me better, but today language is not a factor. So, so it's getting more and more complicated. And that's how uh, we, we are creating more debates. What is our border really? Yeah. When we talk about nation, we, we talk about a country which is a collective home. Yeah. So when we are talking about a collective home, if we come to the individuals, people living in Assam or in Murshidabad or in Malda, <coughs> in Chor, yeah. home means up where we feel secure, where, where we feel uh, safe, where we feel protected. But someone like Noor Islam in Devish's film, it is a home, but where is he looking at? What is he staring at? Because this home is not secure. And the state which gives the promises to give the security to each homeowner yeah. is no longer remains a home. Your home is not a home. So, so probably uh, that would be, uh, you know, these are uh, subtle points which I raised in my film, not very directly, but it is there. What I yeah. see in other films, it is there in my film in a different context, on a different way, perhaps. No, oh, no, it's it's very powerfully there. So it's it's not been missed by the by the viewer for sure. Thank but you. thank you. You have already helped me segue into uh, Devishri's film. For Devishri's film, it has very few dialogues, but I have a much longer quote that I want to read. In fact, two. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just going to read it because it's just uh, really uh, very heartbreaking. But uh, so you know, there is this is a portrait, a very short film, a portrait of Noor Islam, um, and that Devishri made. I think she shot it in 2019, um, and uh, really. Uh, if I remember correctly, Devishri, as your, your student project, you, you, you actually have nothing to do with Assam, but as a response to the news that you were reading, you decided to go and, and just understand what was going on. Uh, but the, I, I'll just read the quote. So uh, there is a sequence in which, uh, you know, Noor Islam sort of leads us to the uh, NRC um, uh, office and suddenly you know even in terms of the sound it's 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 a large group of people there and we leave Noor Islam aside for a while and at one point the camera looks through the window of the office with the officers doing their work and there's a recorded uh, conversation that uh, you hear and the conversation goes with the official asking the, the name of your village and he says Gagol Mari or Gagal Mori uh, where were you born? Um, Gagal Mori. Where was your father born? Gagal Mori, maybe. Are you sure? I'm not sure. Uh, when were you born? I don't remember. When was your father born? That also I don't know. Uh, when, did you, uh, when did you get married? Uh, uh, sorry, when did your father get married? Uh, I don't know. When did you get married? Uh, perhaps around 27 years ago. Are you sure you're an Indian? And then Devishri gives uh, the text that says NRC Center, Chenga Assam. Um, so in a sense, this film really brings us to uh, the, very, uh, the very difficult present that we are in. Uh, and before I go on to Devishri, in the beginning of the film, there's a conversation. I just want to read out a little from there. And the conversation goes, uh, uh, you know, Noor Islam sort of is being reassured by somebody who's taking all his data. Uh, and he says to Noor Islam, uh, don't be tense. You are a genuine Indian. Get rid of all suicidal thoughts. And, uh, you know, so though that's, that's what the film opens with. And this is actually the conversation I read out first is in the fag end of the film. And the film ends with a very long sequence of in, in, in uh, without any dialogues of Noor Islam, uh, you know, getting onto the boat to perhaps go back home and you hear uh, this song, this very beautiful song. Uh, you know, so for me really, Noor Islam uh, in this 20 minute portrait is, 
is offering us really a, a mirror, you know, to to what the the, the kind of ideas that sort of film uh, brings out that that uh, Subhashree's film sort of really opens up uh, Shupriyo's film. And this is just literally, it, it's just, just offering us a way of, uh, of just staying in the moment, of, of realizing the, the, the huge, the, the epic level tragedy that continues to unfold. But, you know, um, on that note, uh, uh, Devishri, it's, it's not really a question, but I, I really wanted, to, wanted you to talk about your experience of going to Assam and thinking through this film and really, uh, in, you know, in a sense, trying to do an ethnography at a time when even the present was not clear to us, but uh, you, you did actually. So uh, over to you. Yeah, so like Saurabh said, it's a beautiful scenario over there, but what goes inside, like it's very contrasting to what you see exactly in Assam. So this was the uh, idea actually which I started with because my mother is from Assam. So as a child when I used to visit, I visited very uh, like four, two, three times usually. But I had this very beautiful scenario of that place. I always thought what a beautiful place whenever if I make a film, I'll go, to, go back to Assam, I'll capture the beauty of it and all those things. But as the time came, and obviously I wanted to do something substantial, not like just to put the camera and capture the beauty. And then I started reading about this. So I was like, nobody's talking about it. Why is it like, is it not that important or what is happening? So I went to northern part of Assam for like 10 days visit with my relatives only. So in upper part, there was, uh, all the offices were blank, nobody was there, everything was chill. I was like, oh, it's not that big, and that's why people are not there, and like, everybody's still there. But later, for a month, when I went to the lower part of Assam, Dubri and Bopita, there I realized, okay, this is what is happening, this is that real scenario, this is something that is needed, like, people need to talk about it, people need to know about it. At least I myself should not know about it because I always thought, oh, what a beautiful place. <laughs> so then I, that, that's how I started researching and talking to people. And I was lucky enough to get uh, like young activists who were helping me throughout. And they uh, got me contact of people who were uh, actually kind of victims of it. So initially I had an idea that I'll talk to two, three at least different categories of people. Uh, and I met a very old lady, very old, and that was the most heartbreaking incident that I had, but I could not film it because then it was. So this lady, when I went, she ran away from her house and uh, her neighbors were trying to uh, call her, Kirinini, come, come, it's okay, it's okay. And she was thinking that we are from the government mm. right, and we'll just catch her. And, and somehow they just got her. And as soon as she came, she, she just fell down on her feet and she was like, please, please don't take me to the police station or something like that. And I was like, okay, this is not what it should be like because she is like, her sons have gone somewhere and she's just left alone, she's a widow. She's working in a government school as uh, she prepares the meal, I guess. So uh, these were the stories of people, but uh, how I picked Noor Islam was, I think uh, this uh, man himself is a character which gives you away the exact scenario because it uh, like sometimes pe when people see my film, they're like, is he acting or like, how is he still for so long? But this is how he was. He was not bothering he was not bothered ki, achha, you can place your camera you can do whatever you can ask me whatever because he is so done with all these questions and answers he's like you ask me i have all the answers ready with me all the documents ready with me you tell me and i'll do that because i have lost hope he has literally lost hope and i think that was very important for me to show because i don't know if i can i i don't think that i could have helped him in any way uh, because obviously already activists are there who are helping him 
I just wanted his voice to be heard, basically. That's what I can do with a film, usually. That, that's the only thing that I've tried. And obviously, the chaos in the NRC centers was something that uh, was required for me to show because otherwise, uh, my own family, when I came back, they're like, oh, nothing is there. Why, why did you go even? I told them, they still don't believe. They're like, no, no, no. Like this very small part maybe, you know, some parts, as you know, there is a specific part, there are specific people, specific communities which are targeted. I'm like, no, 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 but my uh, relative also got targeted. I said, maybe, possibly, but the ratio is contract, like completely uh, disastrous and uh, this is what people are going through. So it's very difficult, obviously, to make people understand the scenario, but I try to keep it as real as possible. And uh, obviously, with the kind of edit and with the kind of duration of shots, I try to tell my idea of the situation. But at the end, it's the people who are watching, they have to decide what they have to feel about it. Yeah. No, I, I really thought that the, the, the very beautiful detail with which you filmed the house and Noor Islam in his house, in a sense, provided a counter to this conversation with this, uh, with this NRC officer. And, uh, you know, that's what struck me the first time I saw the film. And, uh, you know, two years later, I'm still uh, really, really uh, moved by how you sort of told the story. But uh, we have a question that has come up and I'm going to sort of read it out. And uh, I'm wondering which, you know, I, I think it would be nice if all of you were to respond to it. But the question is violence performed at various points in time in the process of imagining and making the nation is constantly remaking what nation is and who its legitimate citizens are. Should we see the ingredients we use in the nation building process over time as violence, uh, is violence? Uh, is the never ending reusability of violence in the ongoing process of imagining about nation delegitimizes concept of citizen as a liberated individual with rights, as opposed to the earliest concept of subjects with only duties? Um, this question is open to the panel. Um, wondering, Subhashri, if you want to. Uh, Ah, well, <laughs> it's, uh, I actually need to think about it. It's, it, I don't think this question has, um, it, it doesn't have a pat answer. And, and I think the category of citizenship itself, right? Uh, I individually have a critique of it because it is also a particular kind of late century, 18th century European idea, but it is also something that for many people, especially if you belong to a certain class, uh, gives you a right to claim. So um, I can't answer this question as an are we actually subjects uh, or there is a sovereign which was there before the idea of the nation state came. Um, but I think, I mean, the way I would look, if I had to think about it, the way I would look at the idea of, sit, of being a citizen is it's an ongoing conversation. I mean, it's not a fixed category of this is the nation state, we are the citizen, um, and that's the end of it, right? And historically, if you see it, the idea of a nation state is a very new idea. Um, I mean, I would say it's 200, 250 years old. India is, what, 75 years old, as we're constantly being told. Amrit Tutsav is on its way. So the way we imagine um, a nation state, uh, 100, 150 years from now, may actually look like a very different thing. And which is why I think the importance of thinking about it, reflecting and critiquing it is what is the kind of place we all want to belong to. I mean, the way I would think of it, instead of looking at it through the idea of a nation, you look at it as a kind of the idea of place or belonging, right? I mean, there are some things about the place where you come from from that 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 you are connected to um, and and that could be through a cultural connection that could be a uh, social relations so i would actually think of the idea of a nation state uh, in those terms i also do think that however autocratic um, the idea of a nation state is and we all know what moment we're in there are cracks and slippages and i do think that the current moment we are in where today is one year's 
I mean, it's a different kind of thing, but one year of the farmers' protests uh, since they uh, did it, and uh, the bill was actually repealed last week, right? Um, so I do feel like uh, it is an ongoing process. Um, it's not as if it's the end of history and time and narrative, and um, that's how I would look at it, and I would look at the idea of it through place and belonging. I'm not sure if I've answered this person's question, but that's how I think of it. No, I think uh, the, the question is pretty much uh, offering a similar critique, right? That the, the, the idea of citizenship will almost always necessarily create moments of violence being performed because it necessarily then decides who is the citizen, who is the legitimate citizen and who is the, the delegitimized citizen, right? Exactly. But, but I mean, I'm sorry, just to interject, but as I think Saurav's film actually shows um, in some ways, or, or um, that there are these slippages that no matter yes. how, however many borders that you create, there are always slippages. And of course, there are deeply tragic consequences. I mean, many of you would have read about what happened in the English Channel a few days ago where 33 people died because they were trying to cross to the UK uh, from France. Uh, so there is, of course, a violence, and that violence is structural. The fact that these people had to sit on a little dingy and come to seek a better life. But I also think there are constant um, slippages in that. So one lens is that of violence, but I, I personally would think there are other ways of also actually intellectually thinking about it. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, this question came to me uh, rather like an introspective question. It, it, uh, the way how we um, define a nation. Uh, the, uh, if we think of a nation which has a group of people or communities, who have things in common, like language, like food habits, like values, you know, social uh, norms that uh, come together, we can be inclusive and form a nation. And it is not, it's not a violent process, it's an inclusive process. But I think when you start defining the uh, nation, not in terms of inclusion, but exclusion, that the that moment the element of violence will come in. You know? So uh, that is that way we have seen in history, a uh, nation can turn into a theocracy, which is a violent process. Yeah. So, so how you look at a nation state as say, um, said, we are in a, let's say, quasi-federal uh, kind of um, structure where we, uh, the moment we, uh, because this has lots of, you know, disparities from north to south, northeast and whatnot. I mean, we are, we are actually very different, but somehow we found the elements of commonalities which bonded us together. There are certain, you know, bases. The moment we try to break those norms which united us or keeps us united, the violence will erupt the moment you try to bring in the elements of exclusivity, the moment then it is it, bound to happen. And I think that's happening today in different ways and forms, passed in the parliament or not outside the parliament, you know, said rules or the rules that we think that we can create ourselves, this leads to violence. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, Devishri, in the in the context of your film Noor Islam, uh, you know, do you? Yeah, Sorry. To violence. I just want to say violence, not always physical, but mental violence, which is happening at least in present day also. Like, if you talk to any Muslim citizen, there is some kind of fear, some kind of trauma is going on in their heads, and they are thinking like two ways, he okay, this or that, this or that. So I think physical violence is noticed, but the kind of mental violence which is going on, it is something which people need to notice and need to work on that. Yeah, no, and I think the question is also suggesting this idea that the, 
you know that the citizen is a, is a is a way in which to understand like he writes citizen as a liberated individual with rights uh, is 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 the tricky kind of, of formulation uh, because necessarily the flip side of it is the 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 delegitimized citizen without rights so i think it's a really interesting uh, question um, but are there any more uh, questions that uh, people have uh, uh, any and or not not just questions, comments or, or thoughts on the the ways in this which in the ways in which these four films are sort of offering us uh, a re recalibrating the way we uh, understand the issue. Um, we are almost close to. Uh, ending time, but uh, because we did so much of the talking, I really hope there's at least one more question. Um, okay, so uh, no, there doesn't seem to be uh, any other question, but uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think really the, the only thing that I would, uh, you know, sort of want to end this conversation with is, uh, you know, while I really appreciate Subushi, um, the way in which you have you have tried to sort of locate historically this current debate on the NRC uh, and the CAA, specifically in the context of Assam, um, and and I think it's a very it, it, there's no getting away from that the historical timeline that that you have. Uh, uh, put out for us. But I think the really important uh, thing for us to consider is the many ways in which your four films, um, while looking at the personal, uh, are really able to um, offer us, uh, you know, um, I don't want to use the word uh, nuances, but you're offering us a very layered kind of way to really understand it, both, both in terms of you know, theoretical questions, uh, of course, the affective uh, kind of understanding of what this issue could mean. As Devishri said, it's, it's, it's the kind of uh, uh, emotional and mental violence and not just the, the physical uh, violence that uh, these policies are wrecking on, on people, but also really a way to um, open up uh, ways in which we want to counter the you know, create a counter narrative and a counter narrative to actually oppose, stand in opposition to what is happening. Uh, you know, really for me, the, the way the four films are able to look at, uh, you know, the sense of temporality within these places of spaces of violence uh, is something really that has, uh, has been lovely to watch in, in, together as these four films. Uh, individually, there's so much to think about within the film, but there's a larger narrative that your four films have sort of offered to us that for me has been quite uh, precious. And I hope, uh, you know, um, okay, there's, uh, sorry, one question as I'm wrapping up. Uh, uh, Latika, please go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, uh, the question that Latika asks is uh, to sort of, thank you for reminding me, actually, I had made a note of that, is in today's context uh, in 2022, sort of, are you, do you have an idea of where Sophie and Rubel are now and, and what's happening with them? Okay, very much. I mean, uh, anybody who watches the film, I, I have this question. And uh, yes, I'm very much connected uh, to, um, not only Rubel and Sufi, but many other people who live in Chor. And uh, right now, um, Rubel is married. Uh, he lives in Chor, but uh, mostly uh, he has to go to Kerala, which is far away, which he started going to Kerala when he was a kid. And a lot of people uh, go to Kerala uh, as uh, labor. Or in some other job because West Kerala is a richer state than West Bengal. The labor rates uh, are higher, so they can save some money. But right now he cannot go to Kerala because of the lockdown, and so there is a problem which we talk about. Uh, if there is a problem, we somehow solve it. 
Um, Sophie is, uh, is now works in a um, uh, hardware shop, but unfortunately life in Chor or in that border region is not like uh, ours. So he is right now in hiding, but I know perfectly well that he is safe and he has not done anything wrong, but still living in border life is different. And Latika will be very happy, and all of you probably, that, uh, uh, that the, this film, Chor the No Man's Island, was released in theatre, commercial theatre, last month in West Bengal, in London, in Kolkata. And it is very rare to release documentaries in uh, commercial theatres, but it did run for uh, two weeks and very well, and all the audience, uh, the, they, they connected to me in the social media or otherwise, and they wanted to know, had the same question, how is Sophie and how is Rebel today? So we created a collective firm, a fund in the social media itself, where people sent their gifts or money or whatever for Sophie and Rebel, which is helping them a lot in this difficult time of lockdown when people are unemployed and Rubel cannot go to um, uh, Kerala. Or, and uh, Sophie needs money for legal uh, reasons. So, so I'm, yes, I'm Latika, I'm very much connected to these guys and they are growing and my uh, beards have become whiter, <laughs> lighter, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much, uh, Saurabh, for uh, that. And uh, I think that's a note at which we can uh, end this conversation. Thank you again to the filmmakers and thank you so much to the SSAF for, for hosting this, for supporting Subhashree's, I think, very, very, very uh, compelling and important project. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for being there. And over to you, Subhashree or Latika, I'm not sure. <laughs> Latika. Yeah, um, no, I had one more question, uh, if I could, since we have two minutes, which is about the role of the landscape. And I was typing furiously um, while you were speaking, is the fact that ecology is such a central part of precisely what is going on, right? The fact that land isn't from uh, the role of the river and it's changing course. In Shupriyo's film, his father says, I hope at least the sky remembers me. I'm counting on that. Um, as filmmakers, and again, this goes back to that question of form, is that how does one and all of you use landscape in such remarkable ways or show landscape uh, in that? How does one avoid the pitfall of a romanticization of let's say river, uh, boatman songs, etc.? cetera? I mean, thank you. Uh, uh, Dev Shri or I mean, I have, I mean, I'd like to respond, but Deshri or Saurav, one of you would like to go first. I'm happy to go. After. I think I haven't left it behind. I carried it in the film and I tried to portray whatever I wanted with the landscape and with the romanticization of song and scenario, all those things. So I think because I, as a, a child or as a like film enthusiast, always liked those motifs those things so i tried using them and uh, yeah, whatever okay yeah uh Shubhushri, uh can i yes yes absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, yes uh, especially in my film latika the landscape plays a major role now and uh, i was very uh, doubtful whether it, does it look like a calendar or does it go with the theme of the film? And the way you look at nature, I we think we have our own aesthetics. And when I interacted with the local people, do they have the same set of you know um, learned aesthetics, Eurocentric vision, how to look at, how to frame, how to compose, which you learn? Uh, in, you know, in painting and photography, etc., etc. Actually, if you look at the songs, they are very artistic. You know? The way they look at the nature is also very artistic. But if you give them a camera, they may not compose it. But the way per they perceive nature is, is beautiful. 
so i suppose i i learned a lot of things how to look at landscape how to look at the river because i've seen people sitting by the river for a very long time and i'm i really loved how Subhashri took the interview of the uh, man looking at not at the camera but looking at the water you know so i suppose these come very spontaneously uh, in, intuitively and landscape and humans uh, the, uh, the especially the landscape of eastern india where river plays a very very important role are very come very naturally and sometimes i used uh, night vision as uh, survey mentioned because there was no light because it is disconnected it's inside the river there is no electricity so uh, initially i tried lighting up with led lights battery operated led lights and people were surprised to see such lights you know they know what a light is and they thought it's some ceremony going on so they you know and you can see in a dark place you can see a small streak of light from very far so i thought that this is not practical and when i used the night vision i saw the nightness of the night i saw the eyes of people burning like animals and i could feel that the way we treat them as subhuman beings it is the right expression so i think the camera style and the you know it become it can become a statement uh, so that that so i used it uh, in my film that's all um i just you know almost out of time so i'll just say quickly that actually um that is a question that thank you for asking that question because for me i was trying um as devshri said for anybody who's traveled to different parts of assam uh, it is a stunningly beautiful state but in the context of the neli and 13 other villages um from the first time i left i was trying to use the landscape uh, to explore a kind of forensic of history because actually in the film every uh, space that you see and i don't say it is the site of the massacre right so i think for me from the first time i went even before i knew uh, who would be in the firm um, and the second time i went for research my camera person amit mandi came as well i knew that the fields and the river were going to be a character in the firm because this beautiful landscape actually had this kind of forensic memory and deep violence embedded in it uh, which for me uh, because i was not going it's not like the nrc happening now i was going 32 years later so as as i mean what is your task as somebody who's going to people asking these really painful questions 32 years later um, so it was also a way of entering that world for me the landscape and as you said i had this constant anxiety and sometimes i still do is there is that thin line between uh, a certain kind of romantic over aesthetization and that of of it which um and that anxiety still exists even when i go for my <laughs> next trip to assam but uh, for me it was actually use la- using landscape it was a very conscious choice to use the landscape thank you thank you so much uh, i'll hand over to my colleague gayatri hope uh, good evening everyone by way of introduction i am gayatri upal associate director at ssaf Uh, on behalf of SSAF i would like to thank the filmmakers and panelists for agreeing to be part of this engaging online discussion and for making their films available online prior to this discussion the films will be uh, available online till 28th november on our website ssaf.in thank you subhashri krishnan for curating the series of films and this discussion titled image and memory and to the panelists and filmmakers Saurav Sarangi, Supriya Sen, Devshri Nath, Subhashri Krishnan, and Surabhi Sharma. I thank the audience for joining us from different parts of the world and time zones, and for their attention. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce our colleagues at SSAF and thank them for their contribution to this event. Saurav Sel is archives manager at SSAF and he's here and has designed the invitation and managed the technical aspects of the event 
and Malvika Madgulkar, Assistant Editor, Publications and Communications, has handled the communications for this discussion. Uh, Santur Sani is our account executive. Please vis uh, do visit our website, ssaf.in, and follow us on social media for updates about forthcoming programs. Thank you all again for joining us today. Good night.